The War at Sea, 1914-1918 in 1914, the Great Empire of Britannia was drawn into the First World War, dragging its dominions in with it, and Canada was no exception. British officials felt the Canadian Army be best used on land, therefore funding mainly went to the Army, and Canadian waters were left to be protected by British forces. While men from throughout the British Empire fought in the trenches, Canadian men and women worked day and night to produce and ship ammunition, equipment, and food to the battlefront. Canada was now the largest producer of Allied war supplies. All they needed now was a way to get them all across the ocean, and what better way than to use ships and sail them to Europe? There was only one problem, U-boats. The original British strategy for the naval war was to send out some older ships to her colonies and reassure them of Britain's support, as well as aid them with protection of their coasts, while keeping the main bulk of the navy used to blockade the Germans. This worked quite well, at least in the beginning of the war. So far so even, that the German surface navy mutinied, and the country became heavily reliant on U-boats. Early in the war, these German submarines patrolled the Atlantic near Britain, attempting to destroy the British Royal Navy. Early strategies for destroying U-boats were not very effective. They usually involved a ship just ramming or sailing straight at the U-boat in hopes that it would have to dive or be crushed under the ship itself. This was moderately effective, deterring about half the total U-boat attacks. However, the subs had torpedoes that could fire underwater at a long distance, posing a great threat to the ship and sailors on board. The Allies wouldn't develop effective anti-submarine tactics for several years. The Canadian Navy was tiny, also because of the naval crisis of 1910 and its results. Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier proposed the idea of Canada having its own navy that would assist the Royal Navy when needed. But there were many people who disagreed, including Robert Borden and the Conservatives. They thought that Canada should simply help Britain expand its own navy, and in turn, the British would defend Canada during times of crisis. So, in the 1911 election following the passing of the Naval Service Act, the Conservatives won the government and Robert Borden was now Prime Minister. One of the things Borden did was attempt to repeal the act, although he couldn't. Funding for the Navy was severely reduced and all future plans were cancelled. Laurier's idea of a fully Canadian fleet complete with five cruisers and six torpedo boat destroyers was replaced with a sad facsimile of four ships and two submarines. Before the war, the Royal Navy gave two of its smaller cruisers to Canada, and in addition to two more acquired by the government, formed the Royal Canadian Navy. They had less armor than the dreadnoughts, though they made up for this by being smaller, faster, and having sufficient firepower. But by no means were they the state of the art of the time. The submarines were newer, having just been constructed in the United States and acquired by the B.C. government, courtesy of Premier Richard McBride. From the provincial government, the subs were then donated to the Royal Canadian Navy. The two submarines were called the CC-1 and CC-2. They were used in both the east and west coasts to perform minor patrol duties. Some smaller civilian crafts, such as yachts, were donated by wealthier citizens. But compared to the British or German forces, Canada's navy was still infantile. The four main ships, the Niobe, Canada, Rainbow, and Margaret, were stationed on both coasts. They patrolled there, protecting against German threats. The first mission of hostility given to a Canadian ship was in July 1914 to the HMCS Rainbow. Rainbow was to travel south to the United States' west coast and escort two lightly armed British ships back to Canada. As well, they were to search for the German ships and relay positions to the British Admiralty. The mission was a failure since Rainbow wasn't able to find the German ships, and the two British ships returned to Canadian waters by themselves as well. In a brief skirmish at the beginning of November between a Royal Navy and a German squadron in the West Coast, the British ship HMS Good Hope was sunk. The skirmish was led by Rear Admiral Craddock and Vice Admiral Von Spee, respectively. 900 British and 4 Canadian lives were lost that day. These were the first Canadian naval casualties of the war. Later on, in December of that year, the same German squadron was again involved in a naval battle with British forces, but was obliterated in its majority. Starting from September, the HMCS Niobe was used as an escort ship for Canadian troops heading outbound to Bermuda and back. Due to mechanical problems, it was sent back to Halifax for repairs and later reassigned to European escorts. 
She also participated in assisting the British blockade around the New York City harbor where around 30 German ships had been stuck since the beginning of the war. The neutral Americans did not allow armed foreign ships within its waters, and a larger blockade was established outside U.S. water boundaries. Within seven months of active service, Niobe was in need of a severe refit and repair. However, it was decided that it would be more profitable to put the money towards making new ships, and the Niobe was removed from service. In 1915, there seemed to be little threat to the Western Atlantic from U-boats, as most of the fighting was going on in European waters. Most of the patrolling on the West Coast was left to the two Canadian submarines, while other ships were primarily sent on missions to the East Coast. Soon, however, the Germans began extending the patrols to North America's East Coast for fear of the U.S. assisting Britain in delivering supplies. In 1916, U-boats were given permission to stop ships suspected of carrying supplies to Europe and started sinking them in October. To counter this, the Royal Canadian Navy was expanded with numerous smaller vessels. A patrol force was created to do minesweeping and patrols on both coasts. Depth charges, underwater explosives designed to explode at a preset depth, were invented. These were especially useful in taking out U-boats, as an explosion would crush the hull. The Germans then had a great idea. Instead of taking out the Royal Navy's warships, they would target the transports that were so heavily relied upon to keep the country alive. This was to be accomplished using U-boats to attack the practically defenseless merchant ships. At the beginning of this plan, targeted ships were only those suspected of transporting British supplies. Later, the U-boat captains adopted a system called unrestricted submarine warfare, stating that they could sink any ship in the Atlantic, regardless of suspicions, destination, or cargo. The German high command reasoned that if their U-boats were able to destroy 600,000 tons worth of goods every month, Britain would be crippled and slowly starve. Soldiers would have even less food, civilians would have rations imposed on them, and the British would have no choice but to accept defeat. As the war went on, the number of sunken merchant ships reached a peak of 25% of vessels that had set out. Shipping losses for the Allies mounted, and Germany had almost reached its goal. In response to this disaster, the Allies developed and implemented the convoy system, which protected Allied ships crossing the Atlantic. Convoys consisted of merchant ships loaded with goods, surrounded by escort ships, which differed depending on destination and route. During the oceanic routes or parts of voyages, escorts would consist of pre-dreadnoughts and armed merchant cruisers. While in areas more dangerous such as those near Europe, escorts were consisted of mainly destroyers. These escorts were tasked with firing on any U-boat should they appear, and warning the rest of the convoy of an attack. The escorts sailed far enough away from the merchant ships so they could scout ahead, yet close enough so they could not be picked off individually. And the escorts didn't just shoot at the U-boats, they also dropped depth charges in areas frequented by the submarines. After the convoy system was put into action, shipping losses decreased from 25% to less than 1%. By 1918, the Canadian government had set up a Canadian Government Merchant Marine to work with the British convoy commanders and protect the Canadian merchant ships. At the end of the war, the Royal Canadian Navy had grown to over a hundred war vessels and cruisers. Manpower in the Navy had also expanded from approximately 350 men to over 5,000 during the course of the war. Overall, Canada wasn't directly involved in any of the major sea battles during the war, but they did certainly indirectly help win the war by providing a reliable transport of supplies and equipment to the European front lines.